France is one of the oldest nations in the world, with one of the most illustrious histories. Joan of Arc paved the way for the French victory in the Hundred Years' War against the English, and Napoleon marched all the way to Moscow, leaving an almost completely conquered Europe behind him. France also holds the record for the most military victories in human history. Despite all of this, France is best known for its horrendous performance in World War II. Germany invades, Germany uses their blitzkrieg tactics, France surrenders, and usually, this is where the story ends until a few years later, when the French resistance suddenly becomes a big deal, but no details are ever discussed, just that there was a resistance. The reality is that the Second World War was a much more complicated event for France than the mainstream narrative suggests. One aspect that was completely memory hold is the topic of this video. In Berlin, fighting alongside the Hitler Youth and the Volkssturm was a contingent of Frenchmen. These were the soldiers of the SS Charlemagne, and their story is the one I will try to explain today. Firstly, a quick disclaimer. This is a video on the SS, so it's obviously controversial by default. However, I urge you not to overthink it. This video is purely historical, and I will express no opinions of my own. Thank you. And as always, a huge thank you to my Patreon, Subscribestar, and YouTube members who make these videos possible. YouTube is my full-time job, and as my videos aren't monetized immediately and must undergo a manual review, these subscribers are really doing all the heavy lifting, and I can't thank them enough. Without them, I simply wouldn't be able to do what I do. So if you do enjoy these videos, and you'd like to support me, join our Discord, or our weekly Hearts of Iron 4 games, then please do consider clicking one of the links in the description. Even the $2 tier helps more than you can possibly imagine. Thank you. When we talk of the First World War, the country that would most likely come to mind for most people is France. And this makes perfect sense, considering the vast majority of the most iconic fighting took place on her soil. After losing almost 2 million dead soldiers and civilians, it was a pretty simple decision to agree on not wanting to do such a thing again. France had been increasingly paranoid of Germany as time passed. France had stagnated, and Germany was doing quite the opposite. Germany's power had grown and grown in the late 19th century, not only militarily, but also simply in pure numbers. Germany was larger, and had a larger birth rate. This problem absolutely dominated French foreign policy. From colonial troops to an alliance with her oldest enemy England, France would do absolutely anything to tip the balance in their favour. After all, they had been absolutely annihilated when they went head to head in the Franco-Prussian War. This time in the Great War, France came out on top, but despite euphoric celebrations, the victory was only ever Pyrrhic. They had tried their best in Versailles to impose harsh terms on Germany, and had often got their way, but in their minds it simply wasn't enough. Now they had quite the task on their hands, they would have to keep the new Weimar Germany in its cage. In this task, they would fail dramatically. France, in its fear of Germany ever rising again, actually played a part in bringing it about. In the early 1920s, they were extremely harsh on the Germans. The Ruhr was occupied, and brutal colonial troops were brought in, who went on a frenzy of sexual crimes against the locals. The Germans were furious, and patriotic sentiment was sent through the roof. Regardless of all this, Hitler consistently swore off ever making an enemy of France. All territorial losses in the West, he said, would have to be forgotten. Germany would lose far more than she would ever gain by provoking a war in the West, and it was best to just stay on friendly terms, and this policy remained when he got into power. France by this time was having problems of her own. At one point, there was a far-left coalition government, including literal communists, in power during the lead-up to the outbreak of war, and strikes were constant. The nation was far, far from stable, and France really shouldn't have been involving herself in any kind of foreign affairs that would put her in danger, but regardless, they did just that, and let the British Empire take charge of the appeasement proceedings, and by extension, putting the fate of France in her hands. In fact, during the Munich Agreement meeting, French Prime Minister de Ladier simply sat there and kept nodding his head, agreeing to whatever the British and the Germans wanted. Over the following year, however, the popular mood changed against Germany, thanks in large part to warmongers like Churchill, twisting the narrative, but also due to the Germans' mistakes themselves. The occupation of Czechoslovakia looked like an absurd aggression to outsiders, despite them being invited in, and Kristallnacht had shocked the world. As a result, Chamberlain would panic, let himself be dominated by the warmongers, and there would be no appeasement next time. Predictably, in September 1939, France let herself be dragged into the war alongside her ally, Great Britain. A half-hearted push into Germany was made before a hasty retreat, but apart from that, nothing happened until the following year. The French simply sat on their side of the border, trusting in the Maginot Line, 
waiting for something to happen. The Germans, for their part, were firing off peace offers at every opportunity. But once Churchill pushed for intervention in Scandinavia, all that changed. The Germans beat them to the punch. And as a result of his own disaster, Churchill was brought to power. Hitler was extremely familiar with Churchill, and he knew he was the greatest warmonger of them all. As a result, that exact same day, May the 10th, Hitler launched his infamous blitzkrieg into the Low Countries and France. No more would he let the Brits dictate the tempo. We all know what happened next. The French put far too much faith in their Maginot Line, and as a result, German panzers cruised through northeastern France via the Low Countries, and by the 22nd of June, it was all over. The French made peace in the same railway carriage the Germans had almost 22 years earlier. The defeat hit the country to its core, and the whole ordeal was humiliating beyond belief. The German terms were harsh, but the idea was that they would be temporary, and that's why the French signed. The Brits continuing the war at such a stage seemed completely pointless. Surely, in any sane world, they would stop fighting soon and accept one of Hitler's many peace offers. With this thinking in mind, the French accepted paying the costs of the German occupation. The northern half of the country would be part of this occupied zone, as well as the west coast, so the Germans would have access to French ports. These coastal and border zones were restricted areas. In the south, the French were given much more leeway, and this rump state was known as Vichy France. Alsace-Lorraine, a disputed area where both Germans and Frenchmen lived, was subject to German conscription laws, as well as Luxembourg. Another matter heavily affected by the continuation of the war was that of French POWs. When peace was made with Germany, everyone assumed the general war would be over soon. Instead, however, many ended up remaining POWs for years, although programs later, such as sending French workers to Germany in exchange for the freedom of POWs, was implemented. Most just wanted to forget this whole horrible ordeal, and Philippe Pétain, the new Prime Minister, quite agreed. He saw the collapse of France as the culmination of wider issues in French society, and much like how the Battle of Elysia had brought the French closer together, he felt this defeat would too. He immediately made a call for national regeneration, a complete overhaul of French society, focused on religion, family, and anti-modernism. Trends of the past were quickly halted. One example was that motherhood was now promoted once more, whilst the female workforce was reduced. Work, family, and country was their motto. On the 11th of October 1940, Bataille broadcast a message to the nation in which he talked of putting an end to the centuries of German and French friction so that the two could work together for future European peace. Bataille wasn't alone, and there were several other movements in France who sought closer ties with the victorious Germans. One of these was Jacques Doyle of the French Popular Party. On the 22nd of June 1941, the same day that Germany invaded the Soviet Union, he proposed sending a legion of French volunteers to fight alongside the Germans in their so-called crusade against communism. Then followed a few months long recruitment campaign in a hunt for volunteers. The unit was given the name Légion des Volontaires Français, the LVF, and Pétain's government sent an official telegram wishing them the best of luck. In the end, however, despite the impressive recruitment campaign, only 1,600 volunteers came forward, and only half of that number passed the medical examinations. Between July 1941 and June 1944, there were 13,000 of these applicants, and again, only around half of these made it through. Most of the initial volunteers stated pretty predictable ideological reasons for signing up. Among the most prominent was, of course, anti-communism, but Catholicism was also very prevalent, some also simply joined because of the impressive wages. Doriol set off with his first set of volunteers in September 1941 to Poland, where they were given German uniforms with the French tricolour on the sleeve. Here, they then swore an oath of allegiance to Adolf Hitler. Some were initially rather disappointed, as they were expecting to be fighting in French uniforms, and they certainly weren't expecting to be swearing an oath to Adolf Hitler, a foreign commander-in-chief. Regardless, their worries were quickly soothed with the help of their priest, Father Jean de Mayol de Lupe, an enthusiastic National Socialist. In late October, the men were ready, and they set off on their crusade. On the 6th of November, they reached Smolensk, where they were no better equipped for that year's bitter winter than the Germans were. Regardless, they marched on towards Moscow whilst their heavy equipment followed them in horse-drawn wagons. When they finally reached the front, 63 kilometers outside the Russian capital, the numbers weren't pretty. 400 had already been lost to sickness or had become stragglers. One third of the men were suffering from dysentery, and the worst part was that this was just the beginning. On the 1st of December, in minus 40 degree weather, one of the two French battalions were ordered to attack the 32nd Siberian Division in the middle of a snowstorm. This was far from a fair fight. 
By the time a week had passed, the 1st French Battalion was so depleted that it had to be replaced by the 2nd. When all was said and done, 65 Frenchmen were dead, 120 wounded, and 300 had frostbite. After this mess, Lieutenant Colonel Richet reported, quote, The men are keen enough, but lack military training. The NCOs are quite good, but cannot do much because of their inefficient superiors. The officers are incapable, and were only recruited on political criteria. The Legion is not fit for combat. Improvement can only be achieved by renewal of the officer corps and through military training, end quote. Action followed criticism, and the regiment was sent back to Poland, where 1,500 of the volunteers and most of the officers were dismissed and sent back to France. A new wave of volunteers arrived to replace them. The two battalions from before were now merged, and a new second battalion was formed from the new volunteers. They remained here to train, and in the end, there was three battalions with 900 men each. They were then sent off separately to security divisions behind the lines to assist in the anti-partisan war. During all this, however, the German assessment of the LVF was still poor. The French volunteers were a far cry from the Scandinavians, Dutchmen and Flemings of the SS Viking, who had blazed their way through Ukraine and into the Caucasus. In June 1943, Colonel Edgar Paud, a former officer in the French Foreign Legion, was given command of the LVF. Petain ended up promoting him to the rank of general in the French army, but the Germans refused to accept this, and he functioned as a Wehrmacht colonel in reality. In that year, another 91 officers, 390 NCOs, and 2,825 soldiers set off from France for the Eastern Front, but frequent incidents at home with the police hardly gave them a glowing reputation. In general, they were despised by most Frenchmen, and everyone viewed them with suspicion. Even the Germans saw them as both politically and militarily suspect. In July, direct enlistment to the Waffen SS was opened up as the SS began to accept non-Germanics into their ranks, and slowly took over the responsibilities for the foreign volunteers that the army had previously held. This move attracted another 3,000 volunteers, and a new formation named the French SS Volunteer Grenadier Regiment was set up. There was also other Frenchmen elsewhere in the German army and navy, as well as in the Todd organization and police duties. Many of these men now began to leave and join the SS, however, and it was around now that the whole concept of French involvement in the Eastern Front changed. Before, it had been about fighting for the glory of France, and the group was completely intertwined with the collaborationist parties back in France. Now, however, it was more about fighting for Europe as a whole. As the war continued to go against the Germans in 1944, the LVF was given a chance to prove itself when they were called upon to block the Moscow-Minsk road near Borisov, just outside of Minsk. Here, on the 22nd of June, one of the LVF's battalions fought a delaying action alongside police units and a handful of tanks. It was brutal fighting that cost them 41 dead and 24 wounded, but the Soviets were ravaged in return. They lost 40 tanks and were coming up against such stiff opposition from the Frenchmen that they reported back that they were fighting against two divisions, not the single battalion that they were fighting in reality. Two weeks after the battle outside Minsk, the battered French survivors were at Griefenberg in Pomerania, now Poland, where all the French servicemen in the German armed forces were being gathered. The reason being was that the OKV had ordered that all foreign soldiers should be transferred to the Waffen SS for simplicity's sake. In August, a momentous step was taken, and the Waffen SS Charlemagne Brigade was born on the orders of Heinrich Himmler. The Frenchmen of the LVF and the French SS Storm Brigade were to assemble at the Waffen SS training area near Kurnitz, as well as 3,000 to 3,500 French volunteers in the German Navy. Other Frenchmen from seemingly all over the armed forces continued to appear for their transfer right up until the Charlemagne left for the front. Meanwhile, on the 5th of November, another 1,500 Frenchmen appeared to swell the ranks of the Charlemagne. These were from the Malice, a group formed originally as French Premier Pierre Laval's private police force, which turned into a sort of paramilitary organisation to bring order to France against a rising French resistance. The group was initially unarmed, and as time passed, they began to be targeted by resistance assassins. To resolve this problem, they made a deal with the SS. In exchange for light weapons, the Malice would promote Waffen SS enlistment. One of those who joined after the deal was Henri Fenet, a key man in the Charlemagne. By mid-1944, the Malice was essentially at the forefront of a civil war in France, where they attempted to defend the de jure legitimate French government against a ballooning resistance, and then the Allied invasion. As the Allies gained the upper hand, the Malice obviously did not expect any mercy to be given to them, and they fled east with their families and the Germans. In August 1944, there were 6,000 Miletians gathered along with 4,000 of their family members in Alsace. 
The 1,500 Charlemagne men came from this group, where the remainder were taken to further safety in the interior, or northern Italy, where they would join the anti-partisan war. Those that stayed behind in France met with the expected price. Dozens were tried in kangaroo courts and swiftly executed. Essentially, there was now thousands of French exiles in Germany with nothing left to lose. Partly for this reason, many of the Charlemagne men would fight right till the end, there was simply nothing left to go back to but death. Meanwhile, a commander was found for this ragtag group of fanatical Frenchmen, in the form of SS Major General Dr. Gustave Krukenberg, a First World War veteran who spent five of the interwar years living in Paris, where he became well acquainted with the French mentality, and of course, language, which he was fluent in. Prior to this, he had been the inspector of the Latvian SS formations, and had led the defense of Dorg of Pils, with much success, despite overwhelming odds. Krukenberg immediately got to work on requesting the following points from high command, all of which were approved and reveal a lot about the character of the division. Quote, 1. The line of conduct for French volunteers of all ranks could only be, in accordance with their terms of engagement, defensive fighting against the Soviet army advancing on Western Europe. 2. Despite what Colonel Porter said, every volunteer had the right at the time of transferring to the Waffen SS to terminate the terms of enlistment formally entered into by him with other arms of the Wehrmacht. This was equally applicable to the new arrivals. Those who wanted to leave should be released without making it difficult for them. Nevertheless, they could use this opportunity only once. 3. To respect to a large extent the religious sentiments of the French volunteers, who almost without exception considered their engagements to be in the defence of the Christian West, a point that had played a decisive role in their enrolment in France, and to support this point of view in the form of the divisional chaplain, Monsieur Comte de Mayol de Lupe, and his auxiliaries. 4. There was no question of applying national socialist propaganda among the volunteers. They were to remain French, and not just French-speaking SS. The manner in which they saw the future of their country was their business. The troops were not to treat this matter otherwise than official. Arguments about internal political matters were to be discouraged as endangering the spirit of camaraderie. 5. The honour of the French flag and the prestige of the French soldier remained supreme, not only in battle, but also in the way the German civilian population regarded them. End quote. There were other issues to be initially ironed out too. Firstly, the new militians were causing quite a stir. The men already in the unit felt that their arrival would harm the way they were viewed back home due to the nature of the Malise's work in France, which wasn't an unfounded concern. Also, Donand, the Malise chief, kept turning up, often unannounced, and began interfering, causing trouble and making demands, which eventually culminated in Himmler intervening and essentially telling him to retract everything and back off. Secondly, the senior French officer, Colonel Poud, had expected to be given the same rank as Krukenberg. The Germans didn't want to have a French SS general, however, and Poud quite understandably wasn't happy. Himmler once more had to step in, and the two had an interview in which Himmler gave the following assurances. Quote, 1. The brigade would fight under the French flag. 2. One would avoid, as far as possible, engaging it on a front where it would find itself exposed to fighting other Frenchmen. 3. Although the brigade was an SS unit, the practice of Christian religion in it would be absolutely free of restraint. 4. Finally, the capital point, in case of a German victory, the integrity of French national territory and its colonies would be scrupulously guaranteed." End quote. There was also the issue of the various motivations of the men actually doing the fighting. These were quickly ironed out, however, despite the confusing French political situation at the time. At the end of the day, they had bigger problems. Tony Letizia sums up the situation, especially for some of the newer volunteers, in his book SS Charlemagne, the 33rd Waffen Grenadier Division of the SS, Quote, the French Waffen SS was to produce a new type of combatant, young and fanatical, most of whom, not having served in any other army, could be typified as the European soldier. They were like brothers to the other European soldiers of the Waffen SS. They were no longer just Frenchmen, as the others were no longer just Danes, Latvians, Germans, or Belgians. More amenable than the older men to German military instructions, they were commanded in German, manoeuvred in German, and sang in German. All things appeared somewhat scandalous to the brigade's original volunteers, but was this not the common language of the Axis forces in the European army? Their symbol was no longer the tricolour or the war flag with the swastika of the Greater German Reich, but the black flag with the white runes of the Waffen SS. End quote. There was a number of other insignificant petty squabbles about ranks and the like, but in the end, what mattered was that the French volunteers had been concentrated into a single unit, regardless of the difficulties. 
The Frenchmen now spent the winter of 1944-45 undergoing their training for their various roles at different locations all over eastern Germany, which wasn't an easy task given their meagre rations, their lack of clothing and equipment, and also the snowy weather. Those training to be clerks were sent to Breslau and ended up being cut off by the Soviets and had to join the infamous defense. By the time all of the elements of the unit were regrouped and ready for combat, they were big enough to be officially rated as a division. As the Charlemagne stood before it went into the fray, it had 102 officers, 886 non-commissioned officers, and 5,375 men, a total of 6,363 of all ranks. On the 17th of February 1945, the Charlemagne Division entrained at Wildflecken Railway Station, ready to approach the absolute mess that was the Eastern Front. Old men of the Volkssturm and the 14-year-olds of the Hitler Youth had been mobilized, ready to defend the fatherland. The Soviets were on the opposite side of the Oder River, ready to push onwards towards Berlin. At 2am on the 22nd of February, the first trainload of men from the Charlemagne arrived at Hammerstein Station on the Pomeranian border with East Prussia. Here, the idea was that they would have one week to prepare before they entered the line. Back in Moscow, however, orders had been sent to Marshal Zhukov and Marshal Rokossovsky requesting an attack on the Germans in Pomerania in order to split them in two. Here, the Germans faced a 1 against 3 to 5 infantry disadvantage, a 1 against 2 to 4 tank disadvantage, and a 1 against 4 to 6 artillery disadvantage. On the 24th, the Frenchmen could hear the intense artillery bombardment from their camp in Hammerstein. They weren't going to get their week's rest. The front was being held by the 32nd Infantry Division, which was raised in Pomerania and thus defending their home turf, as well as the 15th Waffen SS Grenadier Division, a Latvian formation of excellent quality, who were chomping at the bit to get revenge for the fate of their homeland. The Latvian line simply could not hold against the overwhelming firepower of the Soviets, however, and there was a breach. It was the Charlemagne who was called in to plug the gap. And so, on the 24th of February, a horribly under-equipped Charlemagne would face the largest army the world has ever seen, they didn't even have radios, and only had a few maps with them to figure things out. Regardless, they set off. Refugees clogged the roads heading the opposite direction, and any heavy equipment they had tended to sink into the mud. As they trekked, reports kept coming of the Russians getting closer and closer, until at 7pm, a company of Frenchmen met a hail of bullets near the village of Heinrichswald. A bloody fight ensued, in which the Frenchmen took the centre of the village just for it to keep changing hands. The casualties were horrible, and all the while the Russians were simply bypassing them. The 32nd Infantry Division of Pomeranians had meanwhile been absolutely obliterated, and there wasn't much to stop the enemy from swallowing the Frenchmen up whole too. This was just the beginning of the disaster. Without radios, the various groups of Frenchmen were all over the place in the unfamiliar territory, and Russian attack after Russian attack came over and over again. Several times, the Frenchmen would hold a position bravely and inflict brutal casualties on the Russians, only for a seemingly endless horde of men to continue coming at them until they could no longer hold. Oftentimes, they were fighting against 10 to 1 manpower odds. As the 24th gave way to the 25th of February, things didn't get any better. A seemingly endless withdrawal continued from both the Frenchmen and the Latvians. The withdrawal was completely confused, and the seriously wounded had to be abandoned. Without exception, however, every officer stayed behind to cover the rest of their men's withdrawal as best as they could. As they retreated, several ambushes were set for the enemy tanks, who would inevitably try to capitalize on the withdrawal. The Russians fell right into the trap, and the Frenchmen fired off Panzerfaust after Panzerfaust, sending many cocky Soviet tank crews to a fiery death. Several Frenchmen were bypassed and caught in pockets, however, where they tried, albeit in vain, to hold out. In one such case, after relentless fighting in which the Frenchmen took out many, many times their number, as well as many Soviet tanks, they were left in a hopeless situation in a small village graveyard. The opposing Russians and Poles accepted their surrender, but not before murdering all the injured in cold blood including one French POW the group had found from the 1940 war against Germany, who chose to go with them. The fighting continued into the night, and seemingly endless columns of Russian tanks came at the hastily retreating Latvians and Frenchmen. By 3am on the morning of the 26th, however, the retreat was complete. The Latvians covered the Charlemagne, and by midday, they arrived at Neustettin. At roll call, there was 3,000 men. They had started with 4,500. Some of them had ended up retreating to the north, and were safe and sound, but overall, there was 1,000 missing, and 500 known to be killed. Despite all this, the Soviets were furious with their lack of progress, and the commander was actually dismissed by Marshal Rokossovsky. So clearly, the Frenchmen had been doing something right during the retreat. The men themselves didn't feel that way, however. One report from the morning of the 26th ended, quote, 
The 15th Waffen SS Grenadier Division SS and the SS Volunteer Brigade Charlemagne have thus been split into isolated combat groups, partly losing contact with the rear, and have thus practically entirely lost their combat effectiveness." End quote. Later that same day at 5pm, the Russians took Hammerstein, the town the Frenchmen had set off from two days prior. The withdrawal was only just the beginning, however, and the Charlemagne just about managed to let up their heavy equipment onto an armoured train and get themselves out of there as the Russians were nearing Neustettin early in the morning of the 27th. The civilians, who were now realising the reality of the situation, began to quickly head west too, and some of the last Charlemagne men still in town had to stay behind to defend the area so these civilians could manage to get out. These 250 men, many of which were from a flak company and had to be reassigned as infantry, held the town along with two other small groups of Germans, despite being harassed endlessly by Russian aircraft, artillery, mortars, and tanks. Eventually, the Red Army decided to change tactics. They had spent almost all day throwing wave after wave of men at the town, only for the streets and field of Neustettin to end up being covered with their corpses. Instead, they now tried what had worked so well days before. They would simply bypass and encircle the town. Despite extremely heavy losses inflicted by the Germans, the task of encircling the town was completed in an hour. The defenders had to quickly withdraw in complete disorder, but somehow they managed to reach the German lines. The overall situation for the Germans continued to deteriorate, and Marshal Zhukov had launched another attack with the intent of completely sweeping up Pomerania and reaching Kohlberg. The Frenchmen of the Charlemagne, now a rather emaciated and worn out bunch after days of retreat, were tasked with stopping the Soviets at the town of Kolin. The goal was to protect the vital port of Kohlberg, so more and more German troops could use it to withdraw. On the 3rd of March, the 4,000 man strong Charlemagne had taken up their positions in the small town and the surrounding villages amidst icy, blizzard like conditions. Heavy fighting broke out almost immediately, and the Stukas had to intervene as best as they could in the terrible weather to stop the endless arrival of Soviet tanks, many of which were captured and requisitioned. By 8 pm, a column of 90 tanks and two regiments of motorized infantry were approaching Kohlberg. The main objective. If the port fell, the Charlemagne would be encircled and annihilated, as well as the Germans fighting in the area. By the following day, the entire Pomeranian front was disintegrating, and pockets of stranded troops were everywhere. Having almost encircled the troops in the area, the Soviets swung back east to attack the Frenchmen at Kolin. At 12.30 that moment came, but thanks to the sudden appearance of a Tiger tank, the bridge was blown and several enemy tanks were left in a smoking ruin, bringing the attack to a temporary halt. Regardless, the assault soon continued, and swarms of Soviets crossed the river and held footholds all over the place, until Lieutenant Fenet and his battalion gambled and launched a successful counterattack. The Soviets were sent packing back across the river. The goal now, as was the goal all over the front, but especially in Pomerania, was to buy time for the troops and civilians both to get out of there. Right outside of Kolin, there were columns of defenseless German civilians being endlessly strafed by the Soviet aircraft. At 6pm, it was decided at divisional headquarters to hold the town no matter the cost, but by now, matters were rather outside of the Frenchman's control. A small group of men from the Charlemagne on the road towards Kohlberg had just been absolutely annihilated, along with an SS Panzer unit. With the threat of encirclement and certain doom looming, the bulk of the Charlemagne made a break to the west. As this became more and more difficult, there was split opinion about what to do. Some predicted a massacre if the men didn't set up a defence in the woods, others urged that the men keep moving. The fog was the only thing currently masking the Frenchman's escape during the day, and if it lifted, they would be done for. Regardless of these warnings, the decision was taken for the main force to continue to withdraw by day. At 8am, the fog lifted, and the main column of the Charlemagne, around 3,000 men, was immediately spotted by the Russians. Tanks who had been chasing them now began to rain down fire on the exposed Frenchmen, and a predictable massacre ensued. Many survivors made it to the nearby Belgarde woods, but the majority were captured or killed. The rear guard of 80 to 90 men encountered similar problems. They managed to encounter a group of 150 survivors from the earlier massacre, and they headed for Stettin by night marches, but a few days later they were all captured by the Soviets. Another group of 600 men did however manage to make it after two days of night marches, and on the 7th they were back in the German lines. Other smaller groups met a variety of fates, but most ended up being captured. The entire ordeal was a disaster. One group of 150 isolated Germans and Frenchmen managed to get a hold of three self-propelled guns and pushed on towards Kohlberg, the original objective. Despite attacks by Russian tanks, they continued on their way and broke through the enemy lines on the outskirts of town. Here, they found another 100 sick and wounded men from the Charlemagne. The rest of the town wasn't faring much better than these men. 
Hitler declared Kohlberg to be a fortress, an area to be defended to the last man, and Colonel Fritz Fulried was sent to take command. When he arrived, he found a ragtag group of a training battalion, a Volksrum battalion, and a flak battalion, and a bunch of immobile tanks awaiting repair. The situation wasn't looking hopeful, and the town was swelled with refugees. The population had been 35,000, but now there was 85,000 people stuffed into the town. The local Gauleiter refused entry to any more civilians, and tried to stop the evacuation in general, as the town was meant to be held. Fulreed, however, saw this as the nonsense it was, and began the evacuation of the otherwise doomed refugees, without permission. On the 5th of March, the first Soviet shells hit the town, and on the 7th, the town was officially cut off. By this time, 600 members of the Charlemagne were in the city, and now a part of the siege. Fighting alongside them was most notably the Latvians and the Volkstrom. On the following day, the 6th of March, the first Polish army took over the siege, and later they would be joined by Polish heavy tank units. The French were in action all over the town, but mostly they were assigned to anti-tank duties or the small combat team that was engaged in heavy street fighting. On the evening of the 11th of March, the mass evacuation began. Two German destroyers and a heavy torpedo boat arrived to cover the endless overnight shuttles. The odds were overwhelmingly stacked against the Germans, but they knew what they were in for. On the 13th, the Poles launched a major offensive and captured the town's gas works, itching closer and closer to the vital harbour. Calls were made over the radio for the Germans to surrender, but all were ignored. There was to be no negotiation until the innocents were evacuated. On the evening of the 15th and into the following morning, the last refugees were home free. The operation had gone off without a hitch, and thousands upon thousands of innocent lives had been saved. The Charlemagne had officially won its first glory. In the early hours of the 18th, the last troops withdrew under the cover of a huge bombardment, which prevented the Poles from breaking into the tiny foothold that the Germans had left. Fulreed was the last to leave, and when all was said and done, 68,000 civilians, 1,223 wounded, and 5,213 combatants had been evacuated. In honour of this incredible accomplishment, against all odds in a sea of defeats, Colonel Fulreed was personally awarded the Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross by the Fuhrer. Whilst the Siege of Kohlberg was the main event, other men of the Charlemagne were fighting for their lives elsewhere. On the 4th of March, most of the division had left Kolin, but there were still 600 men left behind, and they were completely surrounded by a vastly superior enemy. Immediately, they were bombarded day and night by Russian tanks and mortars, as well as being harassed by Polish partisans at one point, who were turning up to colonise the lands. The Poles threatened the command post, but they were counter-attacked and entirely destroyed, down to a man. On the 7th, the Russians occupied the town cemetery, but once again the Frenchmen counter-attacked, this time with fixed bayonets, and the Russians were sent reeling. That same evening, it was decided that now was the time to set off and rejoin the rest of the division. The seriously wounded were stripped of their documents and uniforms and left in the care of the German Red Cross in the town. The less seriously wounded were put on horses whose hooves were wrapped in sacks to render them silent. At 7pm on the evening of the 7th, they set off east out of the town, whilst a diversion using all of the last heavy ammunition was set up in the west. What followed was a long, agonising trek to safety in which they were constantly harassed by the enemy. At one point, the column was completely trapped by Russian tanks, but a soldier destroyed them just in the nick of time with his Panzerfaust. Soon after this, they had to cross a main road, where enemy traffic was constantly driving both ways. As they crossed, they were met with an entire column of Russian assault tanks, but instead of capitulating, the Charlemagne gambled and opened up all they had on them. Within minutes, there was four tanks, a dozen trucks and other vehicles on fire, thanks once again to the unit's Panzerfausts. Not realising how weak the Frenchmen actually were, the Soviets then capitulated, fleeing in all directions for their lives. Despite this roaring success, many key men died in the battle. Regardless, they had to continue on, and once more had to abandon their wounded. One immobile 18-year-old asked to be finished off by his section leader, and others who weren't injured and collapsed from fatigue or fell asleep were left behind and lost. Time was of the essence. On the 17th, the Charlemagne exited the woods and were suddenly met with more Soviet tanks. This time, things didn't go so well. The Frenchmen were dispersed and the Soviets took several prisoners. Others got away, only to reach the Oder River, where they were captured, as they had no means to actually cross the river. One group tried to cross on the evening of the 23rd of March, but they were fired upon, and many were wounded and had to be abandoned. The Germans on the opposite side were alerted by the gunfire, and tried to help them across, but it was no use. They were all captured in a potato store following an artillery battle between both sides of the river. Other pockets that tried to break out were more lucky, however, including one containing Krukenberg. 
Another ended up holding out at Gottenhafen, better known as Gdynia, with others trapped behind the lines, including Latvians, Hungarians, Dutchmen, Italians, and obviously, Germans. These men somehow made it out alive, thanks to the efforts of men disobeying the Fuhrer's holdfast order. A massive evacuation was organised, and the Frenchmen were ferried to safety in Copenhagen before setting off again to rejoin the remains of the Charlemagne. Regardless, the Charlemagne had been scattered, and many simply did not make it, or had been whisked off into brutal Soviet captivity. At 4am on the morning of Tuesday the 24th of April, Krukenberg received a call ordering him to go to Berlin quickly and take command of the Nordland Division. He requested to be able to bring a detachment of 90 men with him, and this was quickly accepted. The men he chose were based on their anti-tank experience, and he gave Captain Finet the command of them. As well as this, he was ordered to form an assault battalion of the remains of the Charlemagne and to direct them to Berlin urgently, where he was to present himself at the Chancellery. To counter the lack of heavy weapons the men had, they would be mainly equipped with automatic weapons, like the MG42 or the MP44, as well as the ever-reliable Panzerfaust. Even the trip to the city was perilous. Berlin was by now almost completely encircled, and they underwent air and artillery attacks en route. In fact, the Soviet pincer around Berlin was about to close on their very location. Time was of the essence, and it didn't help that three panicky old men of the Volkssturm blew up the bridge as they mistook the Charlemagne for the enemy. Sadly for those men stuck on the wrong side, they had to turn back. At 3pm, the 300 men who had actually ended up making it across managed to arrive in the city, where they found it horribly unguarded, except for a few Hitler youth patrolling on their bicycles with Panzerfausts. Captain Henri Fenet recalled, quote, We reached Berlin in the depth of the night, very late, coming in from the west by the last route, where the noose was slowly tightening. The crackling of machine gun fire now mixed with the rumbling of artillery from quite close to us. We had been marching for hours, ever since a bridge had been blown from under our feet and made us abandon our trucks. We continued, forcing the pace as the sounds of battle drew closer. Harassed, we marched like automatons, our muscles taunt with the effects of fatigue that we could feel climbing up our legs. We marched on, obsessed by the worry about arriving soon in the encircled capital of not letting our way be barred from our last battle, all our being, all our strength going towards the goal that attracted us so powerfully, Berlin. At last we reached it, the last ones were through. Now, stretched out under the pines of the Grunwald, we thought of nothing else but sleep. The din of the Red Artillery searching for the Pischelsdorf Bridge, close by, kept us awake. A violent explosion interrupted the scene. A red aircraft had come to bring us back to the present. Its bomb landed not far from the bridge, and the echo resonated for a long time in the deep valley. But soon, silence and calm returned to the black night, and we were able to sleep." End quote. At 3.30am, Krukenberg met General Krebs at the Chancellery, who told him that over the past 48 hours, they had been calling on numerous officers and units to come to Berlin, and that Krukenberg and the Charlemagne were the first to arrive. Krukenberg then returned to Fenay and the rest of the men, and got them up to speed. The Russians had now circled Berlin. There had been fighting in the suburbs, but it was contained except for in one area, Nukoln, where there had been deep penetrations into the city. It was here that the Frenchmen would be engaged. Fenet simply explains the organisation of the units. Quote, the general had been given command of the 11th SS Volunteer Panzer Grenadier Division Nordland, to which the French battalion was to be attached as an autonomous unit. The Nordland compromised Norwegians, Swedes and Danes, but was much reduced in strength from the fighting in the winter and early spring, being down to 1,500 effectives, end quote. In the afternoon, the men arrived in their trucks at Nukon, singing, and the Berliners greeted them with cheers and applause. Here, they hopped out, and were organised into groups of eight, each led by an NCO. The fighting in Berlin was rather confused, so these small groups would have to fight battles, pretty much in isolation. At 6am on the 26th of April, the first contact with the enemy came, as the Frenchmen and their Nordland allies assisted a tank column in counter-attacking, and it was quite the anticlimax. A group of Frenchmen who were far more bunched up than they should have been, believing they were in cover, were completely taken by surprise by Russian anti-tank gunfire, and 17 men were immediately killed, as well as even more wounded. Regardless of this, the men moved on, and they pushed from building to building with grenades and bayonets, clearing out each one as they went. As they did, the locals would often appear from cellars, overjoyed to see the French volunteers. Quote, Often they came up to us with a cup of coffee or a glass of milk in their hands. Drink up, you must be thirsty. Others insisted that we spend a few minutes with them in their cellars to share a meal prepared from the last of their rations. All this was very kind and very moving, but we really had to get on with the job." End quote. After a long day of hard work, 
heartbreaking news came. Their attack had been for nothing. At the same time as they had advanced, the Soviets had unleashed their main attack all over the city. To add insult to injury, they were the only ones to actually attack that day on the German side, so to their left and right there simply wasn't a front. They would have to withdraw to make a more defensible line. To help them in their task, they were sent reinforcements in the form of Hitler Youth Boys. We had already received reinforcement in the form of a barn of Hitler Youth, several hundred boys of between 14 and 16 years of age, who charged with a magnificent spirit, blind and deaf to danger, uncaringly throwing themselves on the enemy, strong in their juvenile inexperience. Moreover, these youngsters fought like old soldiers. On preceding days, we have seen them leaving in commandos into the suburbs to neutralize the advancing tanks. Today, we find them again in the street fighting along with us, the most savage, the hardest, most murderous possible. They go fighting ahead with their Panzerfausts, with rifles often taller than themselves, as naturally, if they were marching with a brass band and drums, unconcerned about their losses, however numerous, and clearly aiming to perform as well as their elders." End quote. As the day pressed on, the fighting never let up, and the Soviets launched an assault on the French position at the town hall in Nukon, during which Captain Finet, the man's account you're hearing right now, was shot in the foot, and had to command the defence, whilst only being able to stand with the help of an assistant and a walking stick. Quote, after some furious fighting, man to man with bayonet jewels, throwing grenades from door to door and window to window, the Reds who had tried to take us in the rear were wiped out or fled. But, following to check on this attempt, they now tried to launch a frontal attack, and this time they spared neither their fire nor their men. We had no intention of letting them get away with this. Our men, and the Hitler youth installed in the town hall, fought like devils, taking advantage of a moment when the Reds seemed to hesitate and made a sortie in strength that dislocated their move completely and enabled us to clear the area." End quote. The Soviets weren't done, however, and they launched a new assault with armour. The Hitler Youth Boys picked off a handful of them, but more seemed to come. Alerted by this noise, a gigantic Tiger II tank approached and helped the boys in their task, sending more and more T-34s to their doom. Things weren't all rosy, however, as once more it appeared there was no front to the size of them, and barely anything behind them. They were holding on bravely, but if they were encircled, that would make the whole ordeal pointless, and they were already stretched very thin. One street was held alone by a Flemish sergeant named Cap, who was turning anything that stepped onto the street into mincemeat with his machine gun. After seeing his heroics, others tried to offer to swap with him temporarily so he could take a rest, but he kept refusing. All day long he would jump from position to position and hold down his street alone. Eventually, he relented, and allowed a little Hitler youth boy named Fink to help him. Together, they held down the street all day, not a single Soviet was able to advance a metre. The battle continued, quote, For five hours we had been completely alone in front of the lines. The few tanks that still had fuel and ammunition remained with us, while the others pulled back. Cut off from the division, we decided to stay in the town hall as long as a line of retreat remained to our lines. The Reds could cut off our retreat with 50 men, but no doubt they would not dream of it, and tried desperately to attack us from the front or sides with their tanks, supported by several hundred men. A wasted effort, the tanks burst into flames or had to turn back, and the infantry bit the dust as soon as they dared expose themselves." End quote. At 7pm, however, the inevitable news came. It was reported that there were Soviet tanks 900 metres behind them, and only two streets remained open for a retreat. Fenet quickly regrouped his men and the Hitler Youth Boys, and they managed to successfully get back to the main German defence, just minutes before they would have been cut off. Here, Fenet realised how bad things were, and he sums up the situation. Quote, Naively, I thought that the belt defence of Berlin would be formed from regular units, organised like ourselves, and I could not understand how the front had cracked so quickly, because in our sector, we had held and would have continued holding much longer, had it not been for the total absence of neighbours having allowed the Reds to encircle us. It was the turn of the person with whom I was talking to be astonished at my astonishment. If all the Berlin front was as well off for troops as our sector, we would not now be behind Hermannplatz. In fact, of properly constituted units, there were only the remains of General Wielding's armoured corps and some SS units, which included our battalion, the Nordland division, and some Liebstandard Adolf Hitler troops at the Reich's Chancellery, not amounting to more than two to three thousand men when the battle began. Most of the troops were in hastily formed ad hoc units of Hitler Youth, Volkssturm, and overage policemen. All were of goodwill. Many, especially the Hitler Youth, were fighting magnificently, but this was not enough. Cadres were lacking, there was no artillery, hardly any tanks, fuel and ammunition was strictly rationed." End quote. Regardless, they managed to survive the day, and the men managed to get a much needed few hours sleep. Fenet was taken to the Denmark Regiment's first aid post, and he rested for a few hours, semi-conscious after his foot injury. 
The 27th of April was much calmer than the day before, and there was only a few cautious advances by individual Russian soldiers. Much of the day was used to regroup and reorganize. Krukenberg reported that various SS volunteers continued to join him, and that eventually, the whole of Europe was represented. Meanwhile, the Soviets launched their long-awaited offensive across the Oder, and now the Frenchmen up north in Neustrelitz would no longer be able to join them. They were engaged in a defense up there. Fenet's men back in Berlin were ordered to defend the Belle Alliance Platz to prevent the Soviet tanks reaching the Reich's Chancellery. The next few days were then spent as anti-tank crews. The Soviets would send groups of tank, or a single tank, to test defenses and get a feel of the area, only to suddenly have Panzerfaust fired at them from the sea of debris by the Frenchman or Hitler youth. One particular notable tank hunter was a man named Jijin, a plumber from Pontin. After two years in the ranks of the LVF and now the SS, he was barely known. He was extremely quiet and simply got on with his work. Fighting in Berlin was an endless cycle. Wave after wave of Soviet tanks came and every five minutes you'd be risking your life. But at this point, no one cared. It was as if life wasn't real anymore. And they were fighting more as robots than as humans, doing the same task over and over and over again without concern for their lives. Krukenberg recalls of this stage of the fighting, quote, In all, the number of enemy tanks deliberately knocked out in our sector mounted to 108, of which at least half was attributable to the French volunteers. This demonstrates well the severity of the fighting and explains why the Soviets were unable to penetrate the front in our sector, end quote. Aside from this, there was of course the infantry fighting. Every single house was fought for and the casualties on both sides were ridiculous. But as always, simply due to how the Soviets went about waging war, they took far more. Fenet recalls one engagement, quote, At the battalion command post, I was received by yells of joy from the runners, who hastened to relate their latest exploits. Really, their tally was quite considerable, and there was no stopping them. Roger and his acolytes located a big building that the Russians had occupied in strength. They had infiltrated the cellars and set light to them, then left to cover the exits and waited patiently. When the fire reached dangerous proportions, the Reds evacuated without taking any precautions, only to be met by assault rifle grenades that caused carnage. Those who tried to get into the street or courtyards were immediately cut down by the assault rifles, and those who tried to take shelter in the rooms still intact were tackled with hand grenades. They were all killed, one after another. When it was over, they had counted about 50 bodies scattered around the building, or in the entrance. The operation had taken place at night in the light of the flames. It was better than the cinema, declared Roger." End quote. By the 29th, the Frenchmen had moved even closer to the Chancellery, and they were now only a few hundred metres away, at an advanced post of the defence. The fighting was the heaviest it had been so far, and whilst continuing to inflict heavy casualties on the Soviets, the Frenchmen were simply running out of men. They, of course, had no reinforcements. Their country had long since been occupied. The lightly wounded continued to remain at their posts, and continued to fight till the end, but the situation was quickly getting perilous. Every man there expected to die. However, for their efforts, they were being showered with medals by the Germans. On the night of the 29th, SS Brigade Führer Monkey recommended Fenet for the Knight's Cross. Krukenberg says, quote, The bombardment raged, and the city was in flames all night of the 29th to the 30th of April, but all the French SS were resolved to hold out until their ammunition ran out, end quote. On the 30th, Fenet's men were reinforced with about 100 well-armed SS men from the main security office, quote, all are full of goodwill and courage, but have long become unaccustomed to handling weapons and lack combat training. Most are between 50 and 60 years old. Nevertheless, their arrival enables a considerable strengthening of the battalion, and besides, they mix in with plenty of spirit." End quote. That day, the 30th, was filled with heavy losses, but regardless, they held. Quote, it is quite calm as night draws to an end. There is nothing in the street but the T-34s burning alongside us long flames dancing around the steel carcass, projecting their violent light against the dark night, which the rose-coloured halo of fires above the roofs is unable to disperse. One hears the crackling of the flames mixing with the distant, confused sounds of fighting in the capital, but sometimes we are startled by heartbreaking cries, cries that are no longer human, the voices of women not far from us howling in their distress, despair and anguish as the men from the steppes assert their bestiality." End quote. That same evening, a Soviet soldier allowed himself to be captured, who turned out to be a Ukrainian. Quote, he brings with him several loaves of bread, which the men share between them with pleasure, for they haven't seen anything like that for several days. In exchange, the prisoner is given cigarettes, which seems to please him. Very talkative, he explains to the interpreter that he is Ukrainian and not Russian. Compulsorily mobilized and a ferocious adversary of Bolshevism, so much so that we could not have a better friend than himself in the Red Army. Of course, we are under no illusions about the sincerity of his goodwill, but we pretend to listen with interest. Confident, he chats with the interpreter, 
replying at length to the questions negligently put to him during the course of the conversation. A communication has been distributed in the red lines today, announcing imminent victory, as there is only one square kilometre left in Berlin to be taken, and this last bastion must be taken by tomorrow in honour of the 1st of May. A burst of laughter greets the translation of these last words. We will still be here tomorrow, old chap, and your pals will get the same as usual if they try and pass. He recognises that we are giving them a hard time, and that morale in the area leaves much to be desired, but we don't believe our ears when he adds that the tank crews were only bored at pistol point. The interpreter asks good-humouredly, if he is kidding us. Niet, those getting into the leading tanks know that they will not be coming back, end quote. The next day, the French command post was under direct assault for the entire day. Men scrambled to be the ones to claim the last Panzerfausts, hoping to increase their tally. If they failed to hold, then the entire front would have to move back at least 50 metres. This task became increasingly impossible as the day progressed, however. Tank after tank was thrown at them, all of which they either destroyed or sent running. Sensing that this was a useless strategy, however, the Soviets simply retreated back a little and then fired endlessly at the building when they were out of range of the Panzerfausts. The command post building quickly began to fall, beginning with the upper floors, which collapsed on top of the men, injuring many. Outside the building, the Russians attempted to encircle them whilst they were busy preparing to move out. The Russian snipers who got in position to kill the escapees failed to secure the basement of these close-by houses, however, and the Frenchmen simply set fire to masses of paper in the basement. Quote, While Ivan plays fireman, we get out. Saluted on our way by several bursts of fire and some grenades, we manage to get through without losses and cross the field of ruins that separates us from our new positions without difficulty. End quote. Krukenberg said, quote, the new front will be easier to defend, for a system of interior courtyards provides excellent communications protected from the enemy, a small compensation for the 50 metres we have just lost." End quote. The Soviets didn't give them time to set up, however, and almost immediately, Soviet tanks appeared, using a new tactic. Instead of going one by one and getting picked off by Panzerfausts, they would instead just rush in in groups, hoping to draw the anti-tank crews together. The Frenchmen were up to the task, though, and an intense back and forth started, Krukenberg describes their thoughts at the time, quote, After the days we have just been through, we are now only acting on our reflexes, and everything we do seems as natural as everyday life. We seem to have been living this infernal life forever. The problem of our future does not even arise, and we see ahead of us more days like this. Knocking out tanks, firing at the reds, throwing grenades, alarms, bombardments, fires, ruins, holding on, not allowing the enemy to pass. All our strength, all our energy is only for this, it is simultaneously our reason for living and dying. I get visitors from time to time, particularly from an officer of the Nordland, commanding a neighbouring company. He comes, he says, to refresh himself with us, although he does not seem to need it. He does not hesitate to express his admiration for his French comrades. Every time he comes, he repeats, While you are there, we are content that all is well, and certain that the sector will hold, end quote. The men had now been pushed right back to a defence post in front of the Chancellery. The closer they got to the heart of the Reich, the stronger the fanaticism of their opponents became. They were just hundreds of metres away from the Führer, and of course, each and every Red soldier dreamed of being the one to get to him, although as we know, none would get the chance. The defence simply would not budge. There was nowhere to desert to, no reason to. These were dead men walking, fighting till the end for what they believed. The only way to get to where the Führer was meant to be would be through these untiring men. One example is given by Krukenberg, quote, Staff Sergeant Olivier, commanding number no. 4 company, beats all records in this field. Hit three times, three times evacuated. He has calmly returned to his post three times." End quote. And another, quote, In all the unit, only Duro and von Wallenroth remain uninjured among the officers. Duro is very proud of the fact that an officer of the Nordland removed his own iron cross to award him with it after an engagement in which he had performed marvellously. End quote. During the 1st of May, the fighting continued in its intensity, and rumours were flying around about a possible surrender, as well as about Hitler's situation. Fenay recounts, quote, The Ukrainian hadn't lied. All night and all morning of the 1st of May, the storm of the Red Assault beats against us with desperate violence, but we are determined to respond with defiance. The Red Infantry has been reinforced and launches waves of attack simultaneously, with the setting off of the tanks. We let the T-34s approach to fire at point-blank rage, or pinning down the infantry with our assault rifles. The latter try to advance again, but they don't get far, and soon they don't get up again." End quote. Later, he continues on to say, quote, We have to wait until they are quite close at the end of a rifle or Panzerfaust, so close that several missed shots could open up the way and cause the front to collapse. The fate of the battle depends on the outcome of every attack. The Reich's Chancellery is being fiercely defended. One moment of weakness, one inattention on our part, and we would have the catastrophe that threatens. End quote. 
As the day continued, Fenay and his men's situation once again became impossible. It was clear everything was coming to an end. Their building was nearing collapse, just like the last one had, and the Soviets were throwing everything they had at it. Most important of all was the flamethrowers who could light the building up at a moment's notice. Eventually, they did just that. Quote, George, the signaller, a placid smiling young Norman with plump cheeks, does his best in his quality as a former Parisian fireman, but soon he has to report that we must abandon all hope. If all goes well, we should be able to remain another hour, not more, end quote. They duly took the Norman fireman's advice, and the men withdrew, successfully fighting off the Soviets as they went. They had survived the day, and the Ukrainians' prediction of the Reds taking the city on the 1st of May, International Workers' Day, had not come true. At 7pm, General Ziegler approached Krukenberg and told him of Hitler's suicide, as well as the death of Goebbels and his family. He also falsely claimed that Eva Braun had tried to flee the Chancellery and was shot. With the Fuhrer dead, everything fell into disarray, and the generals were unsure of what to do. Eventually, it was decided that a breakout must be attempted, somehow. Quote, Everything was now on the move. It was impossible to obtain information about the situation in other parts of the city. Each of the groups assembling with a view to breaking out had to make its own necessary reconnaissance, end quote. At 9pm, the news of Hitler's death would be given to the men, and at 11pm, the defence was to cease. General Ziegler chose to join Krokenberg for the breakout. Early on the 2nd of May, Fenay was informed by his sentries that they were once again alone ahead of the lines, and what was fast becoming a familiar story. They quickly withdrew, but just as they finished setting up at their new location, they were approached by German officers with Russian soldiers, offering them cigarettes, talking about how the capitulation had been signed. Fenay recalls, quote, it's over, he adds. The capitulation has been signed, but he is unable to provide me with any details. No, we cannot believe that it is all over. That's impossible. In any case, we cannot remain here to be taken stupidly. What's happening at the Reich Chancellery? There, at least, we should learn something. And if there is a last square to be formed, we will be the ones to form it, End quote. The Frenchmen then rejected the offer to surrender and quickly took their leave, heading as fast as they could to the Reich's Chancellery via the underground. When Fenet climbed back up near the building and stuck his head out, however, reality hit him square in the face. Russians were walking around everywhere without a shot being fired. It was over. He went back down and the men gathered around him with wide eyes. Quote, Nobody. The Russians are there. Everywhere. The Fuhrer is certainly dead. They lowered their heads in silence. Now, we have to get out of here. In my opinion, the only solution is to try to get through to the west. We will use the U-Bahn tunnels as long as possible. Let's go. We will get out of the situation this time too. Does everyone agree? End quote. Everyone agreed, and they continued on their way, sneaking through the underground as far as they could go before it opened up. Here, they split into smaller groups and vanished, one after the other. Unfortunately, some slow and noisy Volkstrom men arrived at the same time, with the same idea, and quickly attracted the attention of a Soviet patrol, who quickly grabbed the man and began searching for the others. Quote, The Reds carefully searched the whole area and flushed out our group one after the other. We hold our breath as the Russians go past. Several times they stop right in front of us our hearts beating to breaking point. Pressed one against the other, we wait and cling stubbornly to our last hopes. The end comes suddenly. Our protecting wall collapses under angry booting. The Russians surround us and comb through our pockets. The first things they take are our watches, and then our weapons. We are dragged outside where we see drunken groups of the victors staggering around. A swaying Russian approaches us with angry blinking eyes and a threatening mouth. He grabs Roger Albert marching next to me and pushes him against the wall. A guard intervenes and pulls his prisoner back into the column. I thought I had it, whispers Roger Albert to me. At this moment, the drunken Russian returns, seizing his victim again. SS, SS, he cries, pulling out his pistol. A shot rings out, and Robert Albert falls at my feet, without a sound. Seeing that we are about to stop, our guards push us on shouting, and we continue on our way, end quote. Other groups of Frenchmen were picked up in the same way, including 16 of them who were asleep in the Potsdamer railway station. Krukenberg had managed to escape that morning, albeit with heavy losses. They had broken out and crossed the spree with Ziegler, as well as elements of the Nordland and a detachment of Charlemagne men. On the way, Ziegler was mortally wounded by an explosion that injured many others. Against all odds though, Krukenberg made it to Dahlem in southwest Berlin, where he stayed with friends before surrendering a few days later. As I noted earlier, Berlin wasn't the only place where the Charlemagne was at the end. Many were waiting to get into the city, but couldn't make it in time, and were sent back north to Karpin. On the 27th of April, at 10am, a Soviet spearhead of 70 tanks was spotted nearby, squashing any opposition in their path. The remains of the Flemish, Wallonian, and Latvian SS divisions further ahead withdrew to the west to the Neustrelitz-New Brandenburg line, just behind Karpin, 
The line didn't hold for long, and everyone entered a headlong retreat westwards, including the Frenchmen. During three days of forced marching, they plodded across Mecklenburg at faster and faster speeds to escape the pursuing Russians, as well as the Allied fighters, which opened fire on columns of soldiers and civilians alike, like a turkey shoot by now. On the evening of the 1st of May, the men reached the Wismarsch Wehren line, but due to the advance of the Brits in the north, the route to Denmark had been cut off, where it seemed as if everyone was withdrawing to at the moment, and they were now sealed in the Mecklenburg pocket. Major Kranz, a French SS man from the pre-Charlemagne days who had been injured in the foot in the Carpathians, had arranged boats to evacuate the Frenchmen by sea to Sweden, and had chartered ships for the purpose, but now it was all over. Other Wehrmacht units would instead use these ships when it was clear the Frenchmen weren't going to arrive. At 9am on the 2nd of May, SS Sturmbahnführer Boudet Gezi assembled the 50 men with him and gave them permission to disguise themselves as civilian labourers, or to surrender themselves to the British with him. At 3pm, he did just this with a small handful of other men. They declared they were from the LVF and that they were not SS. Robert Forbes writes in his book, For Europe, What Happened Next, quote, At the level crossing, they came upon a column of tanks, presenting himself to an English tank officer as the chief of the Legion of French Volunteers against Bolshevism. Boudet Gazy asked to be taken to an English general. He wished to defend the interests of his men held as prisoners. He and Radishi, a good friend whom he chose to accompany him, were actually taken before a major, who exploded saying, Since you are the commandant of the Legion of French Volunteers against Bolshevism, we're going to take you to Wismar to the Russians who have just occupied the city, and you will sort it out with them. In disbelief, Boudet Gazy even asked if this was a joke. However, it seemed all too real when he found himself aboard the superstructure of a tank, taking him and Radishi to communist lines. It was dark now. Needless to say, the two French SS officers decided to escape. Boudet Gazi was the first to make a move. He jumped and ran into the night. Radishi was about to follow him, but held back after noticing the following tank had seen Boudet Gazi make his escape. The column came to a stop and went in search of Boudet Gazi, but he was long gone. As for Radici, he reasoned that he was only a simple second lieutenant, and thus of little or no interest. The English released him. Thereafter, the two officers joined the mass of anonymous prisoners of war." End quote. Some of the other Charlemagne men met a worse fate. On the 1st of May, two inhabitants of Neustrelitz found two dead French SS men with their throats cut who had surrendered to the Soviets. This was but the start. What followed was a wave of retribution, as the free French attempted to make up for the embarrassment of the past five years. In France already, collaborators had been killed by the thousands, and in the end, over 10,000 as a very low estimate were executed by the Free French, or the French Resistance, whom were mostly communists, or not even French. One example of this retribution was upon a group of Charlemagne men who were handed over to General Leclerc of the Free French. On the 8th of May, he simply had them all executed in cold blood. The youngest of them was only 17 years of age. Many ended up rotting in various prisons. Fenet, the most prominent man in this story, was sentenced to 20 years in prison on his return to France, but was released in 1959, and ended up providing a lot of the history of the division, such as the information in this video, or various television programmes he did for French TV, in which he defended and explained his actions. Many of the Charlemagne were given a chance to make amends with their country in 1948, when France needed manpower for its war in Vietnam. Many were happy to oblige, and in return, they were given their freedom. Others escaped to Argentina or elsewhere in South America like many other national socialists. Some were pardoned and returned home, and others were assassinated, most likely by French intelligence or Mossad. Later in life, many of the Charlemagne men would be founding members of the National Front, now known as the National Rally. Krukenberg ended up serving 11 years in a Soviet prison and returned to Germany. Many of their post-war years were so all over the place that this section would end up being a video of its own, so I hope that short summary was good enough. Regardless, the Charlemagne is one of the most well-known foreign SS divisions all these years later, when so many others have been forgotten. Whilst they only first saw action in the last year of the war, it is almost certainly the fact that they were fighting in Berlin right till the end that brings so much attention. After all, who would have guessed one of the main formations in the Battle of Berlin would be French, based off your school lessons on the topic? It really does defy one's understanding of the whole war, and many people's first reaction will be to wonder what on earth they were doing there. On the 30th of April, the defenders of Hitler's bunker on the day he died were mostly Frenchmen from the Charlemagne, but also from the Nordland, so mostly Scandinavians, as well as the Latvian SS, Spaniards from the Blue Division, and of course Hitler's bodyguard, the Liebstandard. In summary, the vast majority weren't Germans, and as we know, the last ones to leave the Führerbunker area were Fenet and his men on the 2nd of May. I'll leave you to make your minds up on whether their actions were right or wrong. Wir 
Thank you very much for watching this video. If you've made it all the way here, then please do leave a like and share the video. It helps more than you can possibly imagine. I'll be sure to do more of these if you enjoy them, and next up will most likely be the Latvian SS. And to finish of course, the biggest thanks goes to my Patreon, Subscribestar, and YouTube members who make these videos possible. My videos aren't monetized immediately, so without them, it simply wouldn't be possible to do this as my full-time job, and I cannot thank them enough. So if you do enjoy these videos and want to support me, join our Discord server, or our weekly Hearts of Iron 4 games, then please do consider signing up on one of the links in the description. Thank you. Thank you to Lobster to you, Darway Lololol, Sigmar, Emperor Titus, Luke David Murphy, Chechen Natsok, Anton Berglund, Levi E, Friendly Brian, Mr. Malabar, Bushak, Firefly Enterprise, Henry Unruh, Evan Brightfield, Chef Jeff, Ethan Wynn Stanley, Wunderwaffe, Mr. Bloom, Gav D, Gaius Longanese Hanno, JD, Green Rebel, Angus Roxborough, Rocksacker Too Heavy, Alexios Podcast Watcher, Citadel, Haste, Bojan M, Rick Me, Mr. Gaming, Cameron, Sludwig1919, Gloomy, Troy Harsa, Jagged Kampf, Rowan, Swedish Chef, Honda, Mirko, David Byers, Max Anton, Gragas, Conqueror, Espen, Can, Luca Marincic, Veritas Unleashed, The Real G, Joel, Ghost0128, Jack, Bobby Atkinson, John DeGrief, Ward, It's Okay to Be a Nationalist, Inflection Point, Vet Exempt, Automat 762X39, Monsoir Mercier, Charlie Black, The Waller, Suma Klubayek, Jorgen1997, and Admiral Kempinski.